You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. I forgot what I was going to say. Hey, J. President Scott here with another episode of On the Trail with Kevin and Scott. I am Scott. I am the slapstick parts guy that is now scrambling to try and remember what show number this is, which I think is like 184, 187. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure something out. But uh, I will. I'll, I'll, I'll cover for you while you <laughs> frantically. <that> phone. <laughs> uh, I'm Kevin, the engineer. You know the guy that uh, uh, reads instructions. Uses the right tool and most of the time follows those instructions, unless I'm being creative. And 183. Uh, show 183. Yes. Yeehaw. Mm-hmm. Yeehaw. So, how is back into the workforce going for Scott? Uh, <laughs> yes, it is going rather well, actually. Uh, I'm kind of settling into my new position um, for mm-hmm. the most part, learning to do stuff and uh, ch- taking on some challenges with uh, um, vigor and. Um, Caffeine or something like that. Getting up, getting he, up he, folks, you have to visualize the fact he's reading the invisible script hanging in front of his <laughs> face, staring blankly, going, I know what I wanted to say. No, literally in my mind right now, the scroll just stopped. And then all of a sudden you hear like over the loudspeakers, if you'd like to make a call, please hang up and try again. <laughs> Message T4. So, uh, <laughs> so what's new in the... Scott Garage. Oh, Scott Garage. Scott and um, Autumn Garage. Yes. Uh, and, actually, and nudge, nudge. Um, she is actually in our live studio audience at the moment. Um, but uh, <laughs> look at that smile. Um, <laughs> now we uh, got another video up on her page. So look at look for. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, we uh, it was it was the uh, carburetor rebuild video, and we'll just say my twenty four thousand dollar education in audioing. Uh, audioing and videoing, um, editing, as and, well as English and English, um, <laughs> failed me. <laughs> I uh, he's out of practice. Folks. I am so out of practice, and I am. I want to report that the ribbing I'm getting from both sides is quite. Um, yeah, that that look on her face right now is quite needed and expected and taken with stride because I need to step up my game because both of these two are stepping up their games. I need to do the same. Well. And a quick uh, congratulations to Patrick for getting that uh, pilot bearing out. You go, sir, because literally <laughs> we were sitting down and recording. You, you have that magic way of going, hey, they're recording. I'm going to send him a message. Yep. So congratulations on getting that pilot bearing out, sir. Yeah, he's, <laughs> that, that was an interesting one, uh, finding out. And, folks, just for, for information, Patrick, as he said, I tried the grease trick and it didn't work. Um, Patrick, I will tell you that, no, anytime you have a multi-part bearing, i.e. a needle bearing or a ball bearing, pilot bearing, the grease trick usually blows the guts out than uh, actually moving anything. Uh, Not unlike Taco Bell. Yeah. <laughs> that went weird. Not a sponsor of the show. And then uh, he said the bread trick. Whereas the, the uh, solid uh, one-piece bushings, the grease trick works really well on. The other one that Scott had never heard of, folks, for those of you who are <laughs> I haven't heard either a, of an them. older generation like me, you've heard of the bread trick, I'm sure, which is just like the grease trick, except you stuff pieces of bread into the pilot bearing hole and then put a ram, a tight fitting dowel or steel rod or a brass rod or whatever you've got that's a tight fit to the uh, center hole in that bearing. That's the key. Mm-hmm. And then you just keep putting bread in and tapping it with a hammer, putting bread in, tapping with a hammer. And the bread literally acts like a, a liquid, so to speak, a, mm-hmm. a very viscous liquid as opposed to grease, which will liquefy under pressure. Just wear safety goggles. Yeah. And it's supposed to tap the bearing back out by kind of hitting the bottom of the pilot bearing bore and push it back out. Um, and I've actually heard people that take the bread and put a little grease in the hole and put a little bread, put a grease. For the, the bread, theoretically, I'm doing air quotes here, folks, uh, is viscous enough that it d- kind of clogs up around the needles uh, and or ball bearings. Uh, I know the bread trick works with hammering on a again a uh, one piece bronze bearing mm-hmm. but those are back in my youth when pilot bearings were one piece bronze there's a few out there but most of them nowadays are are concoctions of ball bearings pen bearings nylon bearings and get yeah, your bearings yeah you need a you need a you need some some fun to get those out i have had to resort on a few of those with just a small triangular file some nice music playing in the background and sitting under the the vehicle going <laughs> in little tiny strokes, checking to make sure I'm not filing into my flywheel. And then finally you get it close enough that you can take a very 
thin chisel. And yes, I've abused a few wood chisels because of the sharper blade. And you can pop the outer race, uh, not unlike a, a, a race in a wheel bearing, you mm -hmm. know, and then peel it out and cussing the manufacturers going, what was wrong with solid pilot bearings? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, it's funny. We were sitting there talking about this and you made a comment about, like, imagine the, the, the technician that came up with this trick, you know, furiously, just angrily shoving like Earl, Earl is just sandwich. Just shoving the sandwich going, <laughs> and then all of a sudden the bearing moves. <laughs> He's like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Hand me the number two dowel. Well, bread has some miracle properties. You know, plumbers use it too for plugging water pipes that are flowing water. I didn't know that. Yeah, you can stuff the, you can kind of ball it up, stuff it in a pipe, and it will soak up the water and seal it. You know, this is not under full pressure, but you know, that drip and drain as you cut it off and the house water's dry, and let you get in there and solder it. And then you open the valve and the remnants and turn the pressure on, and it blows the rest of the remnants of the bread out. Cool. Um, it's not exactly recommended. You are putting organics into your water pipe, but, you know, there are times when you're sitting in the basement in. <laughs> It's better than having to have a bucket brigade your basement out. Uh huh. So uh, anyhow, uh, <laughs> welcome to plumbing talk with Scott and Kevin. Oh well. <laughs> hey, it's going to get weirder yet. Yeah, that it is. Um, I've gotten a comment or two from folks. Is hey, you haven't posted much, uh, you know, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I'm guilty as charged because reasons. No, actually, <laughs> I can. <laughs> You know, guys, he said, though, this tinfoil hat on, just saying. <laughs> no, I've I've been helping a friend of the show. You've been uh, helping a lot of friends of the show, to be honest. Well, yeah, but this is the one that, <laughs> that I've been spending a, quite a bit of time on, and right. I'm now cleared because they've released it. I didn't mm -hmm. want to steal one of our, our friends of the show's uh, thunder, mm -hmm. uh, kind of literally thunder when you yeah. see their video release. Um, our friends at Gulf Coast Drive Shaft, formerly known as... Uh, uh, specialty, specialty drive shaft, but they've moved over to Gulf Coast Drive Shaft. Uh, asked me quite a while ago, and we've been working on this project to convert a old, very old ship's lathe into a custom built torque testing machine to torque test um, drive shafts, particularly focused on their latest um, offering uh, to the drive shaft world of carbon fiber drive shafts. Um, the carbon fiber drive shafts have the ability to, to be stronger than steel or aluminum, pretty much, unless you're going really thick on the steel or really thick on the aluminum, and be much lighter than even the stock ones. And the problem is, is that while the manufacturer of the actual carbon fiber tube does the testing on the tubes, and the manufacturer of the billet aluminum uh, yokes for the ends and or spline assemblies, uh, they torque test their pieces. But, um, and so they know they've uh, got, especially dry shaft, they know they've got good materials, but it's their job to cut to length and prep the joints and bond them together with a high strength epoxy system. And at that point, they don't have, there's, there's no way at the time to check those bonds. Okay. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for them, the first when they sent them out, and it was only a very small percentage, they had some bond failures, right. which needless to say is kind of hard to put horsepower and torque to the ground when the drive shaft yoke is spinning in the tube. Yeah. Uh, so they said, can we find a way to test these before they leave the shop? And I won't go through all the meetings that we had and phone calls with the suppliers of the parts and the people that were, you know, I guess would be responsible for the materials. But it came back to the fact that we just needed to, Load the drive shaft. Find a way to, and when I say load it, we'll get to the numbers here soon. Soon, and uh, we came up with an idea. And when we broached the idea with the uh, the maker of the uh, carbon fiber tubes, who does have a rotary torque machine, which is really not unlike an automotive dyno, except that it just twists shafts and can turn just about anything into either a pretzel roll. Or a fried frayed end of rope. <laughs> nice. Carbon fiber kind of goes the frayed end. Um, we came up with a way to build a torque test in a static mode. And it basically is a machine built on an old ship's lathe um, that applies calibrated pressure in increments from five foot pounds to um, somewhere north of 4,000. Um, so 4,000 foot pounds. Uh, and if everything works, the drive shaft 
takes it and you can leave the pressure on. You can do what you want. It's an air powered machine, so it's intrinsically safe. Uh, all it does is go if something breaks, <laughs> right. uh, nothing goes flying. And we know that because the very first drive shaft we put in there and we landed it up and at about oh, 1,000, 1,500 foot pounds, it went crackle, crackle, pop. And all of a sudden, the in yoke and out yoke didn't line up anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no drama other than that. No drama in that. It's just, ooh, that's not what it's supposed to do. And actually, the representative from the composite company said, oh, yes, that's very good. That's exactly what it's supposed to do when it fails. He said, so congratulations. And that's really good because that shaft was prepared to go out to um, – Oh, I can't remember the certification company that they're going to for testing. And it would have failed, which would have cost them money to retest. And since then, they have improved their bonding cleanup and, and bonding procedure and uh, haven't had any failures since then. And they've played Good. with the, the machine and they've torque tested aluminum. And what they've we did is we added a laser and a uh, rotary scale so that you can actually see the uh torsion that you're putting into the shaft and and the fact that it's really amazing to me that a carbon fiber drive shaft you you load it and it actually twists and at 3,000 foot pounds of torque which is officially what the carbon fiber people say just test it to 3,000 if the bond holds at three you're you're good all the way up um and in theory the the assembly should be able to take upwards of 10,000 foot pounds of, sh of, of force and understand, folks, I'm not saying your engine has to have 10,000 foot-pounds. I'm saying that you're shock loading when you're, you know, they're building them a lot of the carbon fibers are going into drag strips. They were at Texas yeah. 2K just this past couple of weeks um, watching a few of the vehicles that were, you know, 4,000-pound Cadillacs with the the uh, supercharged V8s launching down the track. Um, the drive shaft can twist and absorb the initial pow of that clutch drop and twist anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees of rotation and give it back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you come down track and you, and the torque loading on the engine comes up and the next thing you know, that it adds that little kick down the road. Uh, so now we can test the bonds or they can test the bonds. It was fun for me. I did it a few times with them. In fact, I'm in the background of the videos <laughs> that they released. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I couldn't share a lot of that at the time because I was trying to help them out. Uh, it's a great, uh, great group of people. Now, before you run out and get a pair of carbon fiber drive shafts <laughs> for your Gladiator, uh, think twice. They're absolutely strong. But if you impact them sideways on a rock and damage them, they're going to broom straw, you know, which simply means they're going to fray and splatter like a cut rope. Yeah. Um, they have their places on off-road vehicles, but they do have their downsides, just like aluminum drive shafts have their downsides. Um, steel works pretty much the best, in my opinion, right. airlines, just my opinion, for those of us playing in the rough stuff. Because it can take a hit. It can, I've seen dented drive shafts continue to work. They shake, but they continue to get you out of there. Aluminum ones, once you dent them, you might get out with them. They might twist. Uh, and carbon fibers, if you hit them hard enough to dent them, it takes a lot to dent them. I'm right. not going to kid you. You might take a good couple of rock bumps. And if you're not an avid rock bouncer, they might be good for you. But do you really want to spend the money for them? Because they are significantly more like four to eight times more than a comparable steel drive shaft. Yeah, so you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Yeah. Particularly with the shorter Jeep drive shafts. We're talking about on the, like the Cadillacs, they're four and five feet long on the Mustangs and on the, on those things. And I realize you didn't get into car talk here. This is just yeah. the, the uses, but we helped them devo develop that, uh, that machine and it's happily in use right now. And if you have any interest on it, look up golf, coast drive shafts uh in on youtube and uh go down their playlist of different videos and you will see um their new drive shaft test machine you can watch a 30 second uh, promo spot on the machine yep. um as well as you know the fun that they're having out there so <laughs> that's why i haven't posted much lately yeah. uh apologize for that the other thing i've got going is i have a non-jeep but still off-road related mm -hmm. project has come into my shop um 
and I wish I had my new shop yet, but my shop still being one bay of a car garage. Um, <laughs> I had uh, the fortune uh, to be given um, a uh, 2003 Cub Cadet Big Country UTV. It is not a quad. It's a two-wheel drive locking diff. It's actually a, let's call it a, an agricultural slash commercial uh, utility vehicle. Very similar to the ones you see on the side of the highway picking up trash. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to, uh, you know, the all-terrainers. Although with the locking diff and the rear end, I was really impressed on this thing. I was expecting to get a toy. Mm-hmm. It's not a toy, folks. It's a 1,000 pounds, 18 horse, a variable speed transmission, kind of the snowmobile classic that you see on a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, two seats, power bed that can carry 800 pounds of load and dump it uh, nice. at the switch. Um, it had one small flaw. Someone ran into a tree. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Whoopsie. Uh, funny thing was, it was still moving. Right. You just couldn't turn right very well. But you can turn left really, really well. Um, that's, and a, that's a NASCAR edition. <laughs> <laughs> Make a left turn. Yeah, so I've spent, uh, I've only had it for uh, about a week now, and I've already put it on my homemade frame jig, <laughs> better known as my trailer, uh, chained it down and bent the outer. It's a three, it, it's a box frame center with two outrigger frames on right. either side. So when I say this thing's a beast, it's a beast. Um, the outrigger frame on the passenger side was bent up about 15 degrees, busted some a lot of the plastic and stuff like that. Um, in fact, it stretched the metal so much that it took some pie cuts of that frame, pulling it back in line, getting the angles correct, and then re-welding it. And then I went ahead and fish plated underneath and on the sides to make sure that it wasn't going to crack. Uh, and then with probably the most sketchy uh, alignment rig I have ever done in my <laughs> life, I may post that video just for giggles. Yes, you should. <laughs> but with uh, strong, heavily warnings. Yeah. Do not try this at home. <laughs> uh, I used <clears throat> a 10,000-pound uh, tractor with the bucket in the ground so as a brake, uh, tied off to the back of both frame rails of the buggy, because after straightening that arm down, I still had the front axle assembly, which is an independent front suspension, were twisted with the two axles being over two inches difference distance back to the first non-bent horizontal cross member. Right. <laughs> um, and the best way, and, and those of you who play in the body shop world like Scott know that you don't straighten them out one piece at a time. If you they were bent as an assembly, you want to pull them back as an assembly. Yep. And then once you have the mounting points true, if the additional parts themselves aren't true, you replace the parts. But you do all your pulling and straightening assembled because that brings all the bracketry back into alignment. And then you also have to go along and do what's called stress relieving, which is a whole other topic in body work to make sure that once you let go of the stress, it, the part doesn't just go boing back to where it was bent. Yeah. Um, Usually we do pulls right from the POI, the point of impact. And that's what I was doing. It was right on that passenger front wheel assembly. Um uh, because the body doesn't count. It's just that blow-molded plastic. Uh, and uh, anyhow, I had it, the tractor with a chain, a Y chain going up to the frame. Then I had the pull strap tied around the impact point using a soft shackle in case it launched, hooked up to my 9,000-pound winch on my Jeep, which you'd think would have been enough. That's only four and a half tons. <clears throat> nope. Um, so I doubled it back with a shiv, uh, still feeding off the soft shackle, so that, again, if I launch something, hopefully I wouldn't take out myself and too much of the rest of the world. Although the <laughs> the the, uh, the loop back shiv uh, would have, but it was fairly heavy. Hopefully it would have saved. Um, ran into the problem because the Jeep drug before the bend unbent. <laughs> So then I pulled my F-250 out, pointed it the other way, and tied its 10,000-pound hitch to the back frame toe points of my Jeep and locked all the brakes, put the Jeep in four low, locked it in park, and put the parking brakes on. And at that point, with 18,000 pounds of winch pull, better known as nine tons, Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
uh, the little buggy uh, took flight, stretched between the two <laughs> ends, and then off to do some sketchy stuff, dude. Uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden, you heard the winch motor go, <laughs> and I looked over, and that front axle assembly was just coming out like butter. But it had to get past that initial set crease. Right. And I pulled, tapped, as they call it, you know, where you'd stress relieve the frame members and bring them back in a line and then pulled a little more and stress relieved and changed the angle of the pull a little more. Yeah. Ended up taking out over two inches of rotational twist. And when I'm saying it, the first twist I took out of the trailer was vertical rotation when the arm bending ups right. and the frame bending up. Then I had to take the axle mount assembly and rotate it like uh, like a train wheel bogey, flat, right. you know, in the flat plane. And uh, stress relieved and tweaked until I was about, mm, let's say, a quarter inch past, over overbent deliberately, because I knew that as it sat in the first couple of times that I went it, it was going to spring back. And sure enough, it is now settled. If you go out and measure it right now, I've got 14 and a half inch on the right and 14 and a half inch on the left to within nice. a 30 seconds of an inch, which as far as UTV goes is spot on. Yeah. Uh, had to weld up a couple of stress <clears throat> cracks and a few other uh, welds that had just fractured from being bent one way and then been being ba bent back the other. And mm -hmm. for those of you who question, yes, I took a uh, grinder and cut off wheel and I sawed down anything that cracked and opened it up to a full root pass and ran a full seam back on what he said. Otherwise, it's kind of put it back to factory. Didn't leave it cracked. It didn't weld over the crack, which is the right. most common thing you see people do. And if you do that, folks, I'm going to come out and slap you upside the head because it's just going to crack again because the crack will propagate from the old crack into the new. Uh <laughs> Here comes Slappy Claus. Here comes Slappy Claus. Right down Slappy Claus. Wait, slap, slap, um, slap. But I, I think I'll put the video with a disclosure <clears throat> over, as he says, yes. don't try this at home, even though I was at home at the time, unsupervised. I was going to say, did you have adult supervision? Nope. <laughs> nope, nope, <laughs> nope. Not nope, me, nope. Susan. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Not Susan either. She's at work. Uh, it's kind of fun when you start pulling stuff like that and you see the piece you're trying to stretch lift off the ground. It means I needed a little lower pull point, but the Jeep wouldn't be any lower. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but it's kind of a one of those, well, um, let's just say worthy of my farm heritage. <laughs> when I straightened a um, Opal Cadet frame after a friend smacked it up yeah. using a fence post on a tractor. I thought you guys just slammed the car in reverse and let it rip it out that way. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Didn't get enough traction <clears throat> in reverse. We tried. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so anyway, hey, Timmy, watch this. Let's get on to our uh, some other <clears throat> listeners uh, interesting. Yes. And, and we, uh, okay. we had a, a wonderful chunk of emails from everybody. Thank you all so much for the, the information. That's fantastic. OK, well, you, with you doing that with the the the, the we have to talk about um, Andre. Okay. With, with the lease thing, that was kind of interesting. OK. Uh, Andre wrote to us and said, you know, hey, small update. Uh, 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 he basically well, let's back up. Yeah. Andre was doing a in frame overhaul is the best way to call it of a, his uh, uh, four liter. And he lives in an apartment. And for those of you who live or have lived in an apartment, you know, there's usually some rules about working on your car in the apartment parking lot. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently Andre's original lease didn't have that clause in it. Right. Go ahead, Scott. So basically, this the story he talked about was interesting. You know, he, he finished swapping out all six pistons last month around midnight as my landlord stood there with my old lease in one hand and a watch in the other. <laughs> but he got it done. <clears throat> but he got it done. And uh, so uh, he, I guess he had to pay, pay uh, like $14 or so. Uh, the, well, the no, stupid, he, he, he calls it the stupid, <clears throat> stupid tax because he yeah. used a ball joint press yeah. uh, in place of a true press for putting... Uh, wrist pins wrist in pins. the pistons, and no, the they're, they're really not the same. No, no, but, not the same. But uh, an absolutely wonderful attempt because I would probably try something creative like that too. Dude, you get an eye for effort from me. Yeah, but um, I don't, before everyone emails me, I know it's not spelled that way. It's just a, it's an inside joke. But um, no, it's it's it, he got it put together. But of course, you know, three hundred miles later, apparently she starts drinking like she has a drinking problem, and that's water. Cool, that's water. that's coolant water. Um, or, and 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 the. The point of his thing was he say, um, well, he made the comment 
that uh, a new engine would have definitely been easier and saved me money, but I think I'm trying to do it right. And it just the more I thought about it, and he's talked about his future work, that he still has some new floors to put into his TJ. And, or the uh, XJ. Is it XJ or TJ? I thought it was an XJ. Oh, did I, I missed that. It doesn't really say. Oh, yeah, oh, I yeah. probably have yeah, to go yeah, down. The, fir- the first email, he has 2,000 oh, okay. XJ. Okay. That's right. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, no, that's that's. I think it's awesome that you're doing it yourself. But yeah. um, I'm going to be honest, uh, in my opinion, that just swapping out pistons and rings, you know, and that kind of stuff, that's an in-frame refresh. It's really not considered an overhaul unless mm-hmm. you pull the block. And I know people will say otherwise, but where the term in-frame comes from versus an in-frame overhaul is usually applied to diesels with removable sleeves where they are uh, O-ring sealed and then the head gasket seals, and you can actually pull the entire cylinder out and replace it. So you can do an in-frame. Otherwise, a gasoline engine, there is no replaceable sleeve. So without machining the actual bore, you have no real feel for, unless you measure it, taper, uh, uh, whether it's round or oval shaped. So there's no question that new pistons and rings will be an improvement. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can have some of those fun little things. You also have no idea what your deck condition is unless you measure it. And it's really tough to do a true flatness measurement on a head and a block. Well, the head you can do on the bench, obviously, because you take it off, but the block. So no, I mean, it's a re- that's why they call it a freshening. You know, you, you you refresh what you can, and it usually adds quite a bit of service life back to the engine. So, not saying it's a bad answer, but it's not really an overhaul. An overhaul, in its true definition, is the block goes to the machine shop. If you have the machine shop, it's yours to do. But you know, and you're gonna uh, measure everything, figure out what you need to bore out the cylinders to. If you need to align hone the mains, if you have to align hone the mains, do you cut them or do you use oversized bearings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that got Scott and I talking a little bit about the the title was repairing versus replacing your engine. Well, I do want a quick byline oh. because that's actually very similar to what I did with my Comanche is uh, I had a piece of piston yep. broken off. Skirt. and yeah. yeah, Well, no, it was the piece of the lip of the piston. It Okay. It, the, the, the injector fire hose, and it was just a bad scene. Oh, okay. So um, my stepdad and I, we honed the cylinder the best we could, yeah. put a new piston and new rings in it, and it got me about another year but the blow by on that cylinder was already done, yeah. and I was having to do oil changes a lot more because I had fuel in the oil, and and it, eventually the engine literally started coming apart. Yeah. So it, to me, that's a stopgap. It, it it can be. can be yeah. It, it's one of those things <clears throat> that there's honing and there's honing. Yeah. Um, if you can get what they call a long stone cylinder hone, okay, which the it's usually anywhere from four. I mean, from three to six stones on spring arms. And a long stoner is probably four or five inch long stones, not the usual two and a half to three inches. And that can do a lot of good um, as far as evening out the the variations in the cylinder walls. Uh, But it's not really boring it to an exact science okay so if you've got minor scratches and wears uh you can use a long stone and get the cylinder true the downside is you've got to measure the result to know all right a certain size piston has a range of the bore it can fit in without being too loose or too tight the same sort of a thing you know is okay do my do i need to hone more just to get up to the next size piston and then rings you know have have a certain gap tolerance yeah um the other thing that i've seen most people do is they don't know the difference when they're buying rings they can buy them pre-gapped which is very much based exactly on that you say your bore is this size with this size piston and we're going to send you the rings that are gapped for that right um most piston rings come just rough gapped which is usually going to take some filing with a ring file to make the ring not close up in the cold cylinder uh, because the ring has to have a little bit of gap. The specs are given in the rebuild manual. How much, and, and what you do is you take the ring and you slide each ring, primarily the first and second compression rings are the ones you worry about, into the bore, use the head of the piston to square them up in the bore, and then you measure that gap with a feeler gauge. And if it's too tight, that means that as the engine heats up, they're going to expand come in contact and build pressure and it will tear into your walls and it'll crack the ring. 
which is really frustrating because then you're back in there <laughs> yeah. doing everything again. So <clears throat> there's a there's a lot to be said for um, the steps to rebuild an engine. So, uh, you know, from what you're saying about, you know, honing it out, the other kind of honing, of course, is a ball hone. And a ball hone is primarily done not to really clean anything up, but to provide that Process. texture for oil to be collected and held in there while the rings seat and then, you know, carry it from that on at the cross section. So let's get uh, on to what we were talking about, about uh, build versus, I'm sorry, repair versus replace. Rebuild. And we're going to go all the way and kind of look at the different options because mm -hmm. there's there's a pro and a con to virtually every option you have. And for the sake of this discussion, uh, we're going to stick with either the, you know, a V6 or the straight uh, six, you know, you know, because people say, well, you know, if you get this particular motor, you can. OK, I get it. There, there's exceptions to every rule, but we're, we're yeah. going to do a general discussion. So let's start off with number one, the most expensive but most reliable option out there is to buy a new engine. Not a reman, but a brand new one yeah. from the dealer. Built new for you. Um, still a viable option, expensive, for the V6. Mm -hmm. Not an option. For the 4-liter. For the 4-liter straight 6. Mm -hmm. Okay? And no more OEM new crate engines for that motor. Yes, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of engines out there that you can buy crate new. But talking in the Jeep world right now, you can get a 3.6. I know that. I think you can still get the three eight crate. I'm not sure. It's going to be all a uh, reman from from the okay. Dealer. So it's so it's, so it three eights already a reman. Yeah. All right. Your next option, okay, um, and in no particular direction. I'm just a couple of my head is a reman. Mm -hmm. All right. Now there's a couple of flavors of reman, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get into some meat on why you might want to do one versus the other. The one is a factory remanufacturer. They're throwing a, a warranty at you. Mm -hmm. They've got their name to worry about. Um, a lot of the high-end remanufacturers out there are good. Mm -hmm. They're more expensive, and there's a downside. And the downside is you don't get any say-so about the parts going into it. Right. Okay. You get what you get. Mm -hmm. You order a reman. It may be reboard. It may not be, be reboard. It may be honed square. It may be, you know, you may have a new crank. It may not. Okay. It may have a reman crank. It may have oversized rings or oversized bearings. You you really don't know. Yeah. Okay. You you're and as far as quality control, you're relying on the decisions of the remanufacturer. That's why if you're going with a remanufactured engine, you really it's it's worth a little extra money to go with a well-known, well-established remanufacturer that offers a comprehensive warranty on the long block assembly. Yeah. Not obviously on your installation, <laughs> but you know. So, <clears throat> go ahead, you had a thought. Well, the uh, actually when I used to work at uh with good old Jerry Klein yeah. um here in Florida, um, we actually used to have an engine company mm -hmm. and, you know, we, you know, us being young in our parts career, we would tear down the, the motors that, that, that came back. We had a defective one come back mm -hmm. and this was like our fifth defective from the supplier. So we're like, yeah, let's just take a look at it. Well, we found one piston was oversized. Yep. We found three different brands of lifters. Yep. We found, and I'm like, no wonder these engines are so cheap. Right. And, and that's exactly the point that I'm saying about choosing a reputable rebuilder. Yeah. Right. They are since no longer in business. Just before, yeah. I, before I get emails, they're no longer in business. Um, I, I'm, 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 the jury's out on parts store remanufactured engines. Okay. I've heard wonderful things and I've heard horror stories on both. And again, I think it's all right. You're going to a middleman, the parts store. They don't remanufacture engines. No. You don't know who they're going to for remanufacturing. Mm hmm. Um, you know, again, if you know the owner of the parts store and you have a good relationship and he'll tell you who it is, you can go check, you know, information feedback on the rebuilder because they're the ones that are calling the shots. Uh, the next step moving down the line in terms of cost and, and time is to you hire a engine machine shop to rebuild it. Right? right, And there are shops just about in every locality. Now there are places in the U S where it's a long ways to that quote unquote locality, <laughs> but, right. um, and you work with him hand in hand. Okay. You can either have him build the engine for you, but involve you, or you can have him just machine the block. 
Uh, and that's going to split right there. If you have him do it, some of them will let you be part of the the rebuild. And when I say that, I'm not saying come in and work. I'm saying they'll say, all right, we're tearing it down. We're cleaning it. We're inspecting it. Here's the results of the inspections. And they will go, we're going to recommend a 20 thousandths over bore and one of the, let's say the number four uh, crank bearing has a deep score. We think we can get it out. Do you want, and they will ask you, are you good with that bore? Or do you, and do you want to remachine the crank? Or do you want to replace the crank? And you have to go buy the crank, but you bring them the new crank. Right. They will ask for your input and record your input as part of the build. It gives you choice. Almost a la carte. Yeah, almost a la carte, but you'll pay for that. Mm-hmm. All right. The flip side is you take it to them. Most machine shops will still take all the front steps as far as cleaning, but you strip it down before you take it to them. You keep your parts. You may take them the cam and the crank as part of the assembly for them to inspect, but you know what they hand you back are the parts machined. Right. And usually a data sheet. So it's up to you now to go shopping for um, pistons uh, to judge your connecting rods, or you can pay them to judge them, to mic your your crank. Maybe they mic'd it for you, you paid for that, and they tell you if it's true or not true. But you have to mic your connecting rods and your crank to go, okay, I need 30 over connecting rod, you know, lowers, and, and my wrist pins are good or not good or that kind of thing. You see where we're going here, folks, is you... Yeah. The more you get involved, the less you're paying, per se, for intermediate, uh, you know, middleman uh, markups. The the build shop, you know, if you work with a machine shop directly and they do it, they're going to they're gonna mark up the parts. Mm-hmm. That's the way the business world works. Yeah. Uh, if you buy it directly, you're not going to pay uh, C rate, but you're going to pay A rate as a primary. But that's still going to be less than C plus markup. Right. Usually, usually. <laughs> uh, and these are all the choices you make, but you get control. But the more control you get, the more the warranty is you. Okay, mm-hmm. particularly now, let's start introducing your labor. You have the machine shop do the work only on the pieces that need it done, and now you're making all the final choices and you assemble the engine. All right. The machine shop will warrant their machinery that their report is correct, that, okay, you're 030 over on all bores. Uh, now, going back to looking backwards, you know, the rebuilder may have said, hey, look, we only have to go 30 over on two of the cylinders. Let's just bore those two and put standards in the other two. Is that the right thing to do? In my opinion, no. Yeah. Because you end up with uneven power pulses, okay? Uh, but it is pretty common in the rebuild world to only do the work necessary because they're building to the lowest common denominator, which is the average vehicle that drives around all day long and nobody puts it to any kind of heavy use. Right. Um, as opposed to Jeepers who go out and go, ooh, mountain, climb, must. <laughs> Full throttle. <laughs> yeah. Um, the only thing I, I, I don't really recommend is unless you are a machinist with a machine shop, I would not do my own block machining. Yeah. Even I wouldn't do my own block machining because there is, it's a fine line. Yes, they're highly technically trained. And I could claim that, okay? I understand what they're doing. But there's still a bit of voodoo in the machine shop that comes from years and years and years of experience. Yep. Everything from the sound of the cutter is making that will tell them that there's a crack you can't see, you know, and didn't show up in magnafluxing. Uh, to the fingertips that can feel the bore and go, yeah, that that hatching just doesn't feel right. Doesn't feel right. And, and, you know, the eye for doing a three-angle valve job correctly in a head, you know, and knowing, really knowing how to use a straight edge and a light to properly check a head so that it will seal to the the head gasket uh, and to the block. Um, as well as they get to learn, okay, this is a four liter iron block, you know, they're they're tough as nails, but you should check the, um, three, four juncture, you know, to make sure there's not a crack in the head because they know that 
Mm-hmm. And unless you know that, you know, you're, you're, so you do pay for a shop. Yes. But you pay for expertise. And that's why okay. you shop for a good shop that talks to you and shares information. They usually cost a little bit more. Schedule wise, they're not going to be quick. Okay. No. They have a queue in front of you. You want personal service? Personal service takes a little bit longer. You want it quick? You're going to get what you get. Yeah. Uh, so is there one better than the other? The answer is no. If you want control, if you want choices, you want to go and buy your parts and you know what you're doing. I've got to underline that last one. You have to know what you're doing because nobody's going to tell you if that wrist pin from that manufacturer works with that connecting rod from that manufacturer to fit that piston. Right. Okay. Um, pretty much the best you can get out as a sales guy is, well, it should. <laughs> I don't want to build a build. I don't want to spend a lot of money building an engine on it. It should. This isn't standardized motor parts. Yeah. Um, so you have to know how to use a micrometer. Mm-hmm. You really need to have a log book to write down your numbers. And then you need to know what the allowable tolerances are and how it all goes together correctly. An engine is a pretty simple animal overall. Minus the computer system. <laughs> uh, but it does require an amazing amount of precision to run well and run long. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, the, the thing you also have to remind, remind if you are going to say, let's say that it's uh, two weeks for the machine shop to get back, you have to remember how the engine goes back together. Cell phones have made that a whole Cell lot easier than have, they used to be. Have made that a little easier. As but long as you, as long as you remember to take the pictures. As long as you, re- <laughs> that's the key. As long as you remember to take the pictures, you know. Oh, Again, I'll remember that. <clears throat> now, what did I tell you ten minutes ago? <laughs> well, that's fine. You can know how the part went, but you have seventeen bolts now that hold that water pump on. Yeah. And they're all three different different uh, lengths. First time you go run that long bolt through a short hole, next thing you know, you're also retapping and threading things. And I will tell you, folks, that I am a great fan of when I am doing anything like that, anything, engine, transmission, differentials. Scott's seen me do it. I have a stack of cardboard out of old boxes that I keep. I cut them flat so they stack up. And I will take things like, uh, let's just say I, I'm going to take a water pump off. Use your example. I will take a gasket and I will lay it down and kind of trace the shape. I will punch holes and I will put each bolt into a hole. That's literally what I was getting ready to say. Uh, you know, and it's a tight hole. And then I'll cut the cardboard down to a size and that becomes stored until needed later mm-hmm. <laughs> because I don't trust my memory at 65 years old. <laughs> you wouldn't understand. That's the thing that scares me is because right now we've done two brand new Trucks, excuse me, on, yeah. on our third, and a brand new, let's say, high performance two door sport coupe that has the flapping penguin emblem on the front. Okay. <laughs> um, needs a new engine. And I'm looking at the guy's tool cart full of bolts randomly thrown in it. Uh, I'm like, man, you are setting yourself up for a world of hurt because this, uh, this uh, German engineered uh, Asian vehicle yeah. is not going to go well the way you think. It's yeah. not a Corolla. But, you know, so I. I I find that my my cheap recyclable <laughs> bolt holders, um, yes, I end up with a stack of them when I do an engine. There's no question about it. Uh, and there are people that make things. If you're in the engine rebuilding business, there are bolt holders that all the way up to the ones that they use at the drag strips, you know, where the guys, every part has a part down to every valve stem, keeper, clip, you know, yep. crank. If you had one part left, you didn't make it faster. Yeah. So, uh, f- you know, but for me, the the the... The uh, using an awl is what I use to punch the holes in the cardboard. We're not we're not high tech here, and the only reason I do the shape is so that you know I know, you know sometimes I don't do a shape because if it's a valve cover, you know okay <laughs> I I will draw a line and go with an arrow that points up to you know right, right. Uh, front and, of a vehicle yeah you know, front of vehicle or something like that to to remember now if it's something I've done before and I know all the bolts are the same a diff cover. Right. I know from experience they're all the same length, same size, same everything in the vehicle I have. Yeah, they'll go in a, a Ziploc baggie. Now, I'm another fan of Ziploc baggies and black Sharpies yep. that will write on the ship Ziploc baggies. And I will say front diff cover bolts mm-hmm. and stick them in there. Uh, and then I'll take them out to clean them and I'll put them back in the bag again. Um and hence, you've seen my box of wires, you know, yep. where all the connectors have the... Uh, connector 
the component, the year, and basic four cylinder, six cylinder, automatic, whatever, for that, so that I can trace all that stuff back down and know where it goes. Mm -hmm. And is that a bit anal retentive? Well, yeah, when you're putting them away, but you're really happy with yourself when you're putting things back together. (laughs) Really happy. Things scarily go back together, kind of like gears. The other thing that's. Yeah, that's another topic. Uh, the other thing that's nice is if you take the time to clean your hardware, okay, number one, it's much quicker to go back in. Um, and I use a, various things from a cleaning bin, you know, with kerosene or, you know, this, that, or the other thing. And you can identify damaged bolts and replace them mm-hmm. while you're waiting for the machining. So anyway. The grit's as, not a good Loctite. Oh, <laughs> No, 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 no. Uh, so looking at it uh, from from start to finish, there's a lot of options there. And again, this goes to things you have to be honest with yourself. Um, everybody's on a tight budget. I understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, do you, I mean, we, we left one option out, which is probably sitting in, in your modern, buddy's garage. <laughs> no, I, I was going to say is, of course, going to the, the salvage yard and mm-hmm. picking up a used engine. Right. Um, that can be a very great option. Um, it's going to be very difficult now in the in the four liter straight six because there's not a lot in the salvage yard that aren't pretty much boat anchors. Mm-hmm. Um, although they're pretty good cores, you know that's another one you can do. There's these there's sub options galore. Yeah, you can buy another engine from the yard that's a similar series. Okay, all four liters are not the same. It's the blocks are similar, but if you had a carbureted one versus a fuel injected one the boss might be there for a threaded fastener but it may not be drilled and tapped right um but you can get those and use that as your core while you still limp along on your dead one and you can build your engines that way Mm -hmm. and then just move the ancillaries over um so how skilled are you how knowledgeable are you what's your timeline you know do you have all the tools do you have all the tools that you need um the shop has all the tools you know I like, in some cases, I kind of like that mid-range. That's when I was growing up, that was almost the only choice you had was you worked with a local machine shop. And I can remember going over there on on different Chevy small block rebuilds and walking in with a box and go, okay, you told me 030 over, here they are. Here's the pistons. Uh, we're going to reuse the connecting rods. And then, okay, uh, there's a new cam and lifters, you know, and we, and they worked with me. Um and uh, did it take some time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It would not have necessarily uh, worked for uh, uh, a <laughs> Mid- midnight mover over yeah, there. Yeah. Mid- Andre. <laughs> Andre. Uh, because they don't think you'd have met your, your landlord's timeline. Yes. Um, but uh, on the other hand, Gunner's saying hi. I have no yes. idea how so much Gunner for gotten the mic. Yeah. I look down and the, there's a hair in front of the microphone waving in front of my well, nose. You know it ain't mine. <laughs> true uh i hope not at least <laughs> oh my god no not like that not like that jeez what are we talking about now so Jeep anyway engines. yeah it's just it, as far as your engine i think you can make a reasonable choice if you if you're honest with yourself yeah um um i've rebuilt engines i have had shops build them for me uh it all really depended on money versus time versus abilities yeah um and uh so uh, there is no right answer in general it's what's right for you yeah well another quick quick little because this one's a very quick subject uh they didn't put a name on there but they said you know hey i want to flat to a tj with my jku yeah. And is that a good idea? And we can actually answer this very quickly. Very, very quickly. Short answer is no. No. Uh, and why do I say, why do we say no? The very simple answer is a stock TJ without winch, without bumpers, without lift kits, without, without oversized, oversized tires. tires. Yeah. Without oversized tires um, <clears throat> basically comes in at 3,500 pounds. Mm-hmm. It can go up to 4,000 depending on your option package. And this mm-hmm. is out of the data on that Jeep. And a JK, um, any year, uh, the JKU, towing capacity is 3,500 pounds. Yeah. You are literally, if the Excuse TJ me. is unmodified and empty, and the JKU is unmodified and empty, you're right at the limit. Yes. 
you start doing anything to either one of those, as JKU is the tow vehicle, the TJs, you're going to exceed the legal tow capacity of the JKU. And I will add something. If you go back to our towing uh, show, that's multiple of them, multiple of them. Towing capacity is not based on the ability of the Jeep or vehicle to pull. Mm-hmm. It never is. It's a based on the ability of the towing vehicle to stop the weight. Yeah. Uh, so everybody, oh, no, JKU will pull a TJ all day long. Yeah, I agree. It probably will. Probably overheat the transmission. But it's <laughs> given experience. I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I do, yes. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Trans Tim 270, here we go. To, to safely stop a towed vehicle of that weight, in a panic situation, you will find that either the brakes will overheat and you won't stop or you'll jackknife. So, yes, there are ways around that. I personally have a um, um, the tow bars Nighthawk, my brake system. I can't remember right now the name of it. Oh, uh, it just flashed in and flashed out again. Hi. Bye. Exactly. But well, it's like I a have Bluetooth a, pedal thingy. Yeah, it's a uh, an inertially, inertial braking system. Um uh, that I actually got for the TJ when I was towing it behind the RV. Um, and it works really well even towing it behind an F-250. Mm. Uh, the difference when you have, and the 250 has the tow capability to pull the TJ flat tow without braking system. But after you have a auxiliary braking system that triggers the Jeep brakes, yeah, I'm not going back. Yeah. Um, so the answer, the sad answer there is, sorry, not safely. Yeah, yeah. Physically, can it move it? Yes. Uh, is it safe to do so on a highway? Probably not. And then DOT catches you, or heaven forbid you have an accident, they're going to hold you accountable for it. Yeah. Uh, it's not really in the range. Um, the thing people forget is the tow ratings that they put on vehicles is with the tow vehicle empty except for a one person, you know, and I believe it's a half a tank of fuel. Yeah. Um, and uh, so. You got you, the significant other, your luggage, luggage a dog, you tools, know, tools. That, um, you, that all, even though that's in the tow vehicle, that derates the tow vehicle's braking capacity. Just the JKU alone. Dry weight on that was 4,200 pounds. Right. And I remember going to the scales one time and with the armor, the tires, oh, I remember that. that was 5,300 pounds. Yeah. So that would have come off of the tow Mm-hmm. available tow uh, ratings. So as long as you remember that tow rating is based on an empty vehicle and is formulated around stopping, not around pulling. And I, I wish more people would realize that. And lastly, yep, these aftermarket bumper covers that have the tow hitch, or the aftermarket uh, rear uh, bumpers that have a tow hitch, if you'll notice, there won't be a rating on that because technically they don't want you towing. Yeah, that's actually for putting your bike rack on the back. Yep. Um Tow hitches, that's a whole nother subject. Uh, a proper tow hitch that has a class one, two, three, four, or five rating are mounted to the frame and are not part of a bumper. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know that's not popular information. I know a lot of you are going to go, oh, but you, I've done that. Yes, you've gotten away with it. I did it. it. Yeah, I did. I, I, I towed the 3,100 pound dry camper with the JKU. And everything else dry. And I'm, I, I'm not. And I'll tell you the truth. Yes, we were so overloaded. It was scary, stupid, and I do not recommend anyone doing it. And let me tell you something: driving on the interstate was darn right terrifying. Yeah, because you're you're up at that weight then that even the draft from semis, the tail would wag the dog. And, and it, I, I stopped. I, and, it, and from that point on, we took one more road trip and we we rented a diesel truck. Right. So we're we're giving you. Our opinions here, yeah. uh, trying on the best knowledge we have for safe towing. Yeah. You can always move over the safe line at your own risk, your own knowledge, your own, I don't want to say responsibility. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I will tell you, like my TJ, it's not 3,500 pounds anymore. No. And uh, I've actually taken stuff off, but I've, yeah. you know, between bumpers, lift kits, uh, larger tires and weights, uh, hard top and that kind of stuff, I'm pushing up that, that higher weight as well. And so I pull it with something rated in excess mm-hmm. um, for the braking capacity. Plus, I added the inertial braking system. Yeah. Um, and I guess uh, we wanted to go on to... A new uh, class thing? Uh, but yeah, but, 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 sorry, uh, having a 
Oh, we're going to touch on another comment that uh, it, we've been told that there's another podcast out there that's kind of neat. It's the Truck Show podcast. Oh, and, yeah. And they're talking about power swaps, and they are, they, they've just interviewed someone, and and they actually, uh, when talking about repowering, one of the things that came up was a comment that it's easier to repower a Jeep with a Hemi because the electronics speak the same language. And that's true. And I'll be honest with you that any, um, what do I want to say here, any power swap within a manufacturer's uh, lineup in a similar generation, and this is the key mm -hmm. part, will be easier because particularly since the days of uh, uh, um, OBD2 CAN bus. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, my TJ is OBD2, but it's PCI bus, right. which is simply, folks, the wiring protocol for the computer network. And before that, there was an SCI bus also called single wire. Um, they're not compatible. OBD2 can, even though they have the same scan port, the same everything, you think they'd be the same. It's two different wiring types of communication. Right. Uh, it's the protocol of the signals traveling on the wire changes. Uh, and then the CAN bus is a voluntary standard that is compatible between different vehicles as far as the communications type. And everybody says, yeah, but you can't use a can Chevy on a can Chrysler. I said, yeah, the communications protocol will work, but they don't talk the same language. Yeah, it's That's like where it comes in. That you have to have the, the wiring protocol is the voltage and the pulse width and the signal strength and, you know, what's the pause and how long is the data bits. But the actual orientation of the data bit that comes out of the speedometer, you know, out of the ECU to the fuel gauge, that's a different standard. That's manufacturer specific. So obviously from that point of view, if you can get a, in fact, it varies from group model to group model to some degree. But pretty much if you can take a Chrysler engine, with an ECU that is a CAN bus of a similar series to a Gladiator, which is a CAN bus of, you know, the current model years. Yeah, you can probably well put that PCM there and then pick the data lines across and, and the gauge cluster will come to life and work because, you know, Chrysler's not crazy, neither is GM, neither is Ford as far mm -hmm. as I'm not going to make 37 different versions of protocol to make the gas gauge move or the speedometer work. They're kind of, hey, it worked on that one. Let's just use that light <laughs> that language on the next one. Yeah. Um, so that does help immensely when you're doing it. It's just not universal across generations. Right. It's uh, kind of like someone speaking from the Northeast trying to talk to a person from the, the, uh, the Everglades. It's still English, but, man, is it regional. Yeah, it has differences all the way up and uh, around the other well i'd liken it even to just any language we're all making noises with our throats and shaping them with our lips <laughs> but the language that's and so and we're all hearing them with the same ears yeah but we ain't talking necessarily well, the same language well it's kind of like the, you know, it's to some people khakis or pants khakis is what you start your car with it all depends <laughs> what about dog keys yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, so, yeah. No, and and uh, sorry that. Uh, let's see. Did, 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 did. Robert's the one who sent us that information. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right, and that other podcast is absolutely right. It mm -hmm. is easier, but then again, I will throw out there that sometimes easy isn't the fun thing. Sometimes yeah. it's fun to do the thing that nobody else is thinking about. You know, <laughs> but uh, you know, it all works. I still. DeBoss Garage, which is a YouTube channel of a gentleman up in Canada who decided to take a Ford, and I guess even the 6.7 wasn't good enough for him, so he went out and got a school bus and an older model Ford F-350, and the school bus had a cat, one of the last cat over-the-road engines, and so he put a six-cylinder cat engine into an F-350, and it's the F-Tree Kitty Project. And I'm serious, that's the name of it. F Tree Kitty, and it's an awesome video. You may okay. want to check out DeBoss Garage uh, and what he went through to put an over-the-road truck engine into the frame of a 350 
crew cab from the, I'm going to say, I think it was in the 90, a 90s chassis, um, and then make everything work. He did. He made gauges and everything worked. He's still fussing around with it and tweaking things, but it's an awesome project. But Meow. Exactly. And the first time I saw the project, F Tree Kitty. <laughs> it needs to paint orange and call it Garfield. No, it's white and it does have a name, but he does have cats in the shop. <laughs> um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to give is a quick couple of shout outs to number one, uh, Quadratech, not a sponsor, but they're information pages Mm -hmm. are very very good so if you're looking for information in one spot on things like uh specifications on different jeeps and stuff like that what was the manufacturer's horsepower transfer cases loadings you know that kind of stuff they have basically every jeep out there good and another website that's really useful for digging up information is um i use novak a lot yeah novak is good uh, sorry, I'm just having a, a, a momentary. Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's a compulsory. I have to use those buttons once. Well, you could actually edit this out while my brain you know, freezes up. But uh... where's the fun in that? <laughs> yeah, aren't you great? Uh... What kind of information is it? Is it engine, drive line? one I told you earlier that ends in Pedia. Crawlpedia. Crawlpedia, yeah. Crawlpedia, there we go. We we got it now. Man, my stomach is just like all oh, kinds of flipping right now. Uh, folks, if you go to Crawlpedia, um, and it's an off-road encyclopedia site, and it has calculators, it's got tech data, um, it has torque datas. We were doing a, uh, a training class yesterday with a friend of mine's shop in, uh, teaching installing gears. And this was odd that the manufacturer and will remain nameless, the good quality product, we used to give you little booklets in there or pages that said, okay, here's a acceptable patterns. Here's the preload torque on this. Here's the backlash on that. And wasn't in either gear set. Yeah. And my go-to for that information that in a single point collection has been crawlpedia for quite some time now because they've got all of their information, uh, categorized and organized really really well so uh and i found them to be accurate against the service manuals 99 percent of the time so just a, a little bit again not a sponsor not tied to them in any size shape or, or or way but i have found them to be a quick handy reference even to the point that the charts the way they formatted the charts are readable on a phone Nice. Which means that if you're sitting there going, oh, crap, okay, what's the, uh, what's the torque spec on a flywheel bolts for a um, uh, 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 87 um, YJ? Mm-hmm. You can get it in there. If you, you flip up, you go to the YJ page, you go to that section 97 and scroll down, boom, there it is. And it's not just Jeeps, folks. It's all kinds of vehicles. You go into axles, and they start off with AMC, <laughs> you know, nice. blah, 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 blah. So awesome. And if anybody from Crawlpedia is listening, my hat's off to you guys. A great, great website. An absolutely fantastic one. Very cool. Anything else on your end? Nothing else on my end. I am, uh, my stomach's a talking, and uh, I got some. Uh, oh, yeah, it is. It's a little after his feeding time. I yeah. can see that now on the little tiny. Of course, I got two great big clocks up here, but, <laughs> but I'm not um, looking that way. No, not really much. Just keep those emails coming. Yeah, that helps keep the show going. Check out the new GPW video on Ott's page. And, um, again, you know, hopefully, uh, I know Kevin's doing his little road trip here soon. Um, oh, I'm, I'm going to be going up to uh, uh, Bantam Jeep Heritage Festival. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, it's actually in Slippery Rock, as we've said before. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to be heading up that way as well as part of a round robin. I'm looking forward to it. That's, I believe, in June here coming yeah. up. And uh, we're actually going to take and see a different kind of off-roading with the Jeep. What's that? It's going up on the auto train. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be off the road, but on the rails. Correct. I like this show went off the rails. But well, but hey, I figured that will work well. Is you know, It's exactly. just a different kind of all. And I like going places. Exactly. So here I am. I'm off-road and going somewhere. Nice. <laughs> With a bed in a cabin, and yes, we're going the luxury route. My wife wants to experience the the full-on pleasures of the old rails. Nothing wrong with that. So we're going to 
We're going to do that. Well, that's what old retired people get to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, us youngins got to get going. So we got laundry to do. We got, I got a desk to put back together. I got to feed the hogs. Uh, I got to uh, brush Gunner after his bath yesterday that almost killed me. But more on that subject so of the Jeep show. So uh, with that, I think it's time we lock the hubs and hit the, the Jeep in four low. Yeah. And hit the trail. And take nothing but pictures, memories, and our trash when we leave the trail. Why can I remember that but not the intro? I have no idea, but it works either way. It, it works either way. So until next time on Show 184, we will catch you guys on the flip side. Bye. Bye. Proceeding has been provided for entertainment only. Proper service and repair procedures are vital to the safe, reliable operation of all motor vehicles, as well as personal safety of those performing those repairs. Standard safety procedures and precaution, including the use of safety goggles and proper tools and equipment, should be followed at all times to eliminate the possibility of personal injury or improper service which could damage the vehicle or compromise its safety. What he said. (laughs) Thanks a lot for listening, guys. You guys have a great day. Bye. (laughs) This has been a Bent Axel Media production.